let's, uh, let's quickly start here just by looking at what we've accomplished over the past six years. We're heading into the increase of the midway of the We've covered about 18 years. We've gone a long, long way. And today, we're going to end off with just a little bit of software to do some of the stuff we've already learned to do by hand. I'm going to introduce you to the software tool that will help us along and take a little bit of the tediousness out of what we need to do for the rest of this course. So there's two software tools that are map lab based for the rest of this course. I'll introduce one of them today. So this is a review then. I'm not going to write out too much on the board, but let's just talk over verbally. The first week, remember, we looked at the objectives of control and why we run control systems. Then we move very quickly after that to look at the components of the control system. Then pretty much everything from the second week till just right now has been looking at models and the class transforms and representing those models in the class transform. And I guess one way you can summarize everything we've done is look at the outline of how we approach the problem. And that's the first step is to write out the OSD. So you had a chance to do that in the term. Uh, then you would linearize any terms. The third step was the deviation variables. And the last class, especially the last Wednesday, we spent a significant amount of time in the class understanding the deviation variables in the class. So that's probably the last time I'll ever emphasize the deviation variables such a We're just going to assume that you're very comfortable with that now. And if you're not, please go review that lecture from Wednesday during reading week. Um, it's really, really is important to get to an understanding of what deviation variables mean. We created deviation variables, and once we have those deviation variables, we can then define a transfer function. And the ability to go from a process where we got the ODE over to the transfer function is really fundamental. And that was why that one question was on the heat exchanger and the tank in the midterm. Asking you to go from a very descriptive definition of the process over to a transfer function. We need to be able to map reality that we see on the plant over to a transfer function block diagram. If we're unable to do that, we're not going to be able to do the rest of this course and build our control routes. So that is a very, very critical skill to be able to convert what you see on the plant floor over to symbolic representation on a block diagram and using transfer functions to do that. So once we have the final transfer function, remember that was in the form of output S okay, so the input S. And we generally have been calling that GP, our process transfer function. Then quickly we can define our inputs. In the past domain and then rearrange and simplify for the output. And then the final step is to bring this back to the time domain, because we have to work in reality, in real life, where we're working in the time domain. So we convert to the output in the time domain. That's a critical part as well. Okay, and we use the last tables to do that. <coughs> so the software I'm going to show you today doesn't take any of these steps away. One, two, three, five, six. The software I introduced today will only do step seven. The software will go from step six to step seven. And it has a little bit of help, I'd say, with steps number five. We will actually define our input in the fast transform in the software as well. This is why the fast transform is so critical to our understanding. And then 
guys, let me just, uh, before we head into the software, as a warm-up, let's just recap what we did last time with the block diagram so we can come forward with that again. Remember the block diagram, we start with our process here. We're going to build on this in today's class. So here's my process transfer function UP, some general transfer function. And in the last class, that was in fact a first order process. So let's just put that in there. We had a first order process with some gain, KT. KT was my gain, and we had a time constant, tau P, S plus 1. And this output over here was my controlled variable. And in that example, it was in fact the deviation temperature. The input to your process is the manipulated variable. And in the example we looked at last class, that was the deviation of the hot water flow. So input and output. Then, as I said, a significant portion of last class was thinking about setting up this block diagram and what it means. Well, we have a set point coming in, a deviation form. And we're going to put that in this block that simply does a subtraction for us. So we know what our set point is, we're going to specify that. In practice, we have the ability to tell the system what our set point should look like. We subtract from that set point what the actual measurement is in the deviation form, and that forms a new variable that we call the error. And that error goes into a, a new transform, transfer function we call GC. And so far, our simplest control system we've been looking at is the proportional only controller. So the purpose of today's class is to look at how we can represent this in the software. And the other purpose of today's class is to understand the shortcomings of this controller. This controller, we've already hinted at that on Wednesday's class, will not do an effective job for us. When we say that, we've got many goals for a, for a control system, but one of our main goals is that our control system should be able to achieve our desired goal of meeting the set point. This controller on its own will not, in fact, reach the set point. And we're going to understand in today's class why that's, why that's the case. Before I move on, any questions on this block diagram and understanding of it? OK, then perhaps one more. Recap from last class was we defined a single transfer function for that entire diagram. We basically collapsed that diagram down to one block. Our goal was to find a single transfer function where if we give SP, we can find one transfer function that will tell us T dash. So that's our overall transfer function for the entire system collapsed down to one block. And last class we said that was the output <coughs> t dash of s over this input, input set point. And we defined it and showed that it was equal to some new gain k star and new time constant tau s plus 1. So in fact, for that first order system over there on the right hand side, through a bit of algebraic manipulation, we can collapse it down to, again, another first order system overall. And k star was equal to the controller gain multiplied by the process gain, kc, kp. We had 1 plus kc, kp denominated here. And tau star, this overall transfer function, was equal to the process time constant tau p over 1 plus kc kp. So again, that understanding is important from last time. We're going to use these two definitions over here to understand a little bit about when I say this control system with proportional only kc has some limitations. 
we can infer what those limitations are from these two equations. Okay, so that's essentially in 10 minutes what we covered over the past roughly two lectures. So Monday and Wednesday is a summary of that over there. Let me leave it at that point. We're going to take it up interactively. As I introduce the software to you, I'm going to, we're going to solve some problems iteratively, oh, sorry, interactively, and we're going to get the software then to confirm our answers. And we're going to use these equations through those examples today. So let's, let's take a look at the software. Now, before I show it, how many of you have used Simulink or know of Simulink? Okay, how many of you have MATLAB? Okay. If you type Simulink at your mind prompt, I've asked that, put that question on the course website last night, do you have Simulink installed? You agree? Yeah? If you, yeah? Yeah? It's also available in the computer labs, in DSP and in JHG. So go to MATLAB, type Simulink, and you have access to the software. So everyone has these tools available. Okay? So let's take a look at how to use Simulink. time domain answer. So that's when I said all the software does is go from that the last transform definition and the block flow diagram back to the time domain. So it simplifies that step for you. The way you use it is, is as you would expect, you start with a new file, so file new, and you start with a new model. So file new model, or simply control N. And it brings up a black window over here for you to specify your model. Now, I've got limited board space over here, so I'm going to disappear this uh, right hand, uh, this left hand pane, and just use the full extent of the window. And the way it works is you drag over the elements that you'd like to see. Now, the key idea with solving anything in Simulink is you need, always need two things. You always need an input, and you always need an output at the very, very minimum. The Simulink model must have those two elements. So you need an input, and you need an output. So let's take a look at that. Now, Simulink calls them slightly different things. It calls this a source, and it calls the output a sink. Okay, so you'll see then on the left here, in the library, the Simulink library, there's several categories. There's sources and sinks go down here. So let's start with the source, and then we drag the source over. Now there's several sources that you can use. These are several types of inputs. You can take inputs from a MATLAB file, you can take inputs from the clock, on the computer, random number inputs. The one we use most commonly is the step input. So drag the step input over. Let's define the step. If you double click on it, you can say when the step needs to occur and by how much it should be. So we're going to tell the step to occur at time equals 2. We want to start at 0 and we want to end at 1. So we're putting in a unit step or a unit magnitude step here. It's going to be 0 initially until time 2 and then go step up to 1 unit magnitude. 
And that's the mean. That's that definition of it. Step <coughs> two of unit magnitude final value. And say okay. So that's my source. Let's put a sink in as well. So several sinks are available to you. You can simply display the output. You can go to a scope. That's the one we're going to use most commonly, the scope. We can also tell the output to go directly to a MATLAB file, or you can go tell it to go to a variable in the MATLAB workspace. Okay, that's useful if you want to plot the data later, or you want to do some analysis on the output in Excel afterwards. But we'll typically simply go take it to a scope so we can visualize it. That's our goal. So as I said, that's the simplest way that you do it. So what you do next is you see this little arrow bump out on the side of the step function. You click and drag that across to scope. And the moment it touches, the line turns from a red dashed line to the black solid line. You release your mouse. So click, drag, release. And now you've connected your source <coughs> to your sink. And then this magic green button up here will be play, run it. And it simulates by default for a period of 10 units of time. Double click on the scope, and then you get to see what that step looks like. So there's my step of unit magnitude occurring at time two. And this button over here, the auto side, auto scale, about the fifth button over from the left, you're going to use that regularly. So just zoom in and it zooms to the extent of the plot. Emphasizing it's going from zero to one at time two. Okay, so that's the simplest transfer uh, sorry, the simplest simulink simulation that you can run. In one source, one sink. Any questions on that so far? Okay, let's uh, let's take this up a step. Well, there's some other nice features about Simulink here. Uh, let's take a look at some of the other elements. There's an entry here called commonly used blocks that you can go look at. Um, let's take a look, however, at continuous. We're going to work in the continuous time initially, and so most of our elements we're going to drag into my simulation will come from this continuous category over here. I'm going to just quickly show you what a time delay does. Now, Simulink calls it a transport delay. It's the same thing. Transport delay is the same as time delay. Let's drag that over and just put it over there for now. Anywhere in your simulation. Just pull it in. But I ideally would like to insert it in between my step and my scope. So if you drag it in all that line, and the moment you release your mouse button, it will automatically put it in that place. Okay. So now we've added a time delay. Well, let's go double click on that, set the settings for the time delay. I'd like this time delay to be three units in time. And say OK. And now what should I observe in the scope output if I run? Where's that step going to occur? So verify that, play the, play the simulation, double click on scope, and we see that step occurring at time five. And now, it's not a nice vertical step as you might expect. Okay? There's a bit of a slope there to it. So what's going on? So maybe before we just use software, Dr. Adams will probably take the same approach with Aspen. We don't just go use Aspen and let it do its stuff and believe everything that it does. Let's actually understand what Simulink is doing here behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, what Simulink does is it takes these diagrams that you've added and it's writing a MATLAB function for you from those figures. So it's converting that image to a MATLAB function and then it sends that automatically to ODE 4.5 and does the integration for you. Okay, so it's taking care of all that integration work behind the scenes. And because it's using ODE 4.5, and you will take in 3E4 and understand what 3E4's integration is about, you know that there's a step size. Okay, when you do that integration with ODE 4.5, there's a step size. And MATLAB, what it will do is we'll use large steps as long as the error is okay, it will take steps. So what's happened there is we've essentially taken very large steps and you're seeing that round inputs. So one way you can go change that, that transport delay to be a more vertical line is to go use a smaller step size. You do that by using the gear icon over there and setting the model configuration parameters. And you can go set those 
so that the set size for ODE45, so there's, you see ODE45 being used. With my integrator, ODE45, I can go select some of the other integrators as well. And I can go set the step size to be no bigger than 1 e to the minus 2. Let's go use a very, a very small step size, and if we rerun that simulation now, I get a far more vertical line occurring. So that's, that's the transport delay. Now, you can select any block and hit delete, and it disappears, breaks the diagram apart, and now you've got this gap in there. So what I want to do is I'm going to go put a transfer function in that gap. Let's go take this guy over here. Here's a transfer function. I'm going to bring it across, and I'm going to insert it into that gap. So make sure your lines are solid black lines. Okay, and I'm going to make the transfer function match the, our process that we're dealing with. The process I, I'm talking about is GP is equal to 3 over 2s plus 1. So my gain here is 3, my time constant tau is 2 plus 1. So we can set that here, double click on the transfer function, and you can tell the transfer function what the numerator's coefficients are and what the denominator's coefficients are. So my numerator coefficient here is 3, my denominator's coefficient is a 2 in front of the s, and a 1 in front of the constant. So 3, 2, and 1. Hit OK. And it will actually show you what that transfer function looks like so that you can confirm that you've entered it in correctly. What would be the final value here in the scope if I hit run now? And as time tends to a long time, what should I observe as the final value in my scope? Three. Three, okay. So, Notice here, I want you to do the following. It's very easy to simply sort of hit play, go look at your answer and say, okay, I believe the output. But I would like you to actually try and predict what your output is before you actually see it. That way you can actually confirm that your understanding is correct. So let's run that simulation, double click on the scope. Okay, auto scale comes in handy here all the time. And we can see that as time goes to long time, we get three units as our ultimate value. Now I can go run the simulation for a little bit longer. Right now it's cut off at 10 units of time, so you drag this over again. Here's where you can set the time. Let's go run it for 20 minutes, hit play, verify the scope that it is in fact stable after that. So you can see there the step occurs at time 2. It stabilizes at a right around time 12. So here's, here's the key point I want to make. This is the process response, if I put in a step input here, so I'm putting a step input over here, it's my manipulated variable, kp is 3, tau is 2, and I'm observing a response that takes roughly from time 2 where that step occurs, and it's taking until about time 12 to reach steady state. So it's taking about 10 minutes to reach steady state. I want you to keep that in mind. 10 minutes to each steady state. This is the equivalent of the operator opening the valve for the flow rate by 1 meters cubed per minute. And there it's going to observe the temperature increase by 3 degrees on the output. And it's going to take about 10 minutes for it to reach that new value and an increase in 3 degrees. Okay, everyone clear in that interpretation? About 10 minutes to reach a new increased temperature of 3 degrees higher than when you started off. Okay, so that's that first order system. Now, let's take a look at feedback control. So we want to add a feedback control here, so let's go delete that line. And what we want to add is simply a single transfer function KC over here. Now you might be tempted to go to MATLAB, I'm simulating I should say, and drag a new transfer function over here for the control loop. And you might want to say, well, I want my numerator 
to be, let's use a KC of 1. Well, actually, no, I'm going to use a KC of 1 third. You'll see why. You might want to go say your denominator is 1. Okay, so apply, OK. And it will do that. Okay. But a, a far more correct way of doing it in the software is to go use what's called a gain. And the gain you can find under the commonly used blocks. And go drag that gain in over there and simply go specify your gain then of one third. So that's a single, that's simply a multiplier. And I'm going to use a value of one, of one third. So it simply takes the input, multiplies it by that value that you type in over there, and puts the output there. The next guy that we need is one of these, one of these summation blocks. So we can get that over here. That's again under commonly used blocks. You see this thing here called the sum block. So let's drag the summation block in. You'll notice, however, there's one problem. The signs aren't quite right. Okay. So double click on that. And what you can do is you can tell Simulink what the order of the signs are. So the vertical pike is always the first symbol. That's your starting point on the left entry. There, that indicates the left plus entry is a plus. The next one we want to be a minus. So just change that plus plus to a plus minus. Hit OK, and then you get your subtraction. So let's put our step input over there. We connect that up to my game. Then the last thing is, how do you wrap this around and bring it all the way back? So the way you do that is you right click on this line, and you drag it across, and I hate this mouse because I can't right click easily. There we go. So right click, drag across, and you notice that as you bring it close by, it, it sees what you're trying to do, and it will attempt to connect it up. So dash dread line means it's not connected yet. The moment it is close to something that's a valid connection, it will turn to black. And you release it, and now you've got your feedback control. Okay, I'm not going to hit play yet. I want you to tell me, take two, three minutes and calculate what is the final value going to be here in the scope. There's a step input over here. What is the final value and what is the shape of this response going to be in the scope? So take two, three minutes and calculate what that is. You've got all the information on the board for that. The answer is not one. <coughs> what, what is
here's how we do it. S P dash of S is 1 over S. We want to calculate T dash of S. So T dash of S is equal to K star of tau star S plus 1, and then we're multiplying it by 1 over S. And using the final value theorem, we can take the limit as S tends to 0 of S times T dash of S. And S times T dash of S as the limit of that goes, of s goes to zero, that's equal to k star. Okay. What is k star in this case? One half. One half. kc times kp, so one third times a third, divided by one plus one third times a third. So the final value I should see over there is a half. Everyone clear on that? Okay, final value theorem is really important in this, in this course. Let's take a look, see if, if MATLAB is correct. Double click the scope. There we go. We reach a half. One thing I want to point out, remember last time when we made a step input just into the process, it took 10 minutes to reach steady state. How long is it taking us to reach steady state now? Let me perhaps just reduce the simulation time. We don't need all 20 minutes anymore. Let's go down to 10. So we step at time 2. How long does it take us to reach steady state now? Five minutes, six minutes. Okay. Right. It's all related to tau. So previously, when I took a step input over here, here's the rule of thumb, and you notice this in the midterm. I asked you how long does it take to reach steady state in the height in the tank when you run at 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Notice those were all multiples of tau. And you get to the steady state within about five times tau is how long it takes to reach steady state. So 5 times 2 is 10 in this example. Here I'm showing you that we're reaching steady state a lot faster. Okay. And that's the purpose of feedback control. That's why we apply feedback control, so we can get to steady state faster. How much faster are we getting to steady state? What is the new tower we get for the closed loop system? Tower is 1. It is tau p, which is 3, divided by 1 plus 1. Is that right? No. Tau p is 2, sorry. So 2 divided by 1 plus 1, so, so 1. Thank you. Okay, so tau p here is 1. Tau star is 1. So 5 times 1, we're going to take about 5 minutes to reach the new steady state from 2 to 7. So what? Do you think is going to happen if I increase the gain on that controller? If I increase KC, it's currently at one third. What happens if KC gets larger? Okay, before we answer this, let's understand why I'm asking the question. Why I'm asking the question is the following. When you have a process, you don't get to change anything on the process. This process is fixed. The only thing that you have as an engineer that you can change is KC. That's the only way you can change what the control system does. Okay? So knowing which way to change KC is important. You don't get two chances. You can either go up or you can go down. Right? But in reality, you don't get two chances on the process. If you go down and you upset the process, you're fired. Or you've broken the process, or you've injured or killed someone. Okay? So we have to be able to tell before we even make the change what the change is going to be. So if I increase KC, what's going to happen? Here's, the, here's your answer. It's bigger. What gets bigger? K star gets bigger. Yeah. Okay, so what does that imply? So previously K star was equal to a half. So let's take a let's put some numbers onto this. If I make KC now two thirds. 
from the Melbourne case here. So two thirds, so I'm getting two in the numerator, getting three in the denominator, so I get two thirds over here as my k star. What's going to happen to tau star? So I had two, and now I'm going to divide by one. <coughs> So I get two thirds as well. Okay. So tau star has gone smaller, k star has gone larger. So my response should be, how would we characterize this response if I run the simulation? two-thirds instead of a half this time. Okay, so we're going to get a little closer to our goal. You know, our goal is to increase by one unit. Okay? Previously, we were only increasing by half at the output, so we weren't actually meeting our goal. Now we've changed our gain. We're going to get to our goal faster, but we're still not actually going to meet it. Let's see if, if that's right. Run the simulation. So now we steady out a little sooner and we land up at two thirds. And you can go increase this gain, let's take it to five units and see what the, that effect is. So run that. Take a look at that. So five units of gain, I get to my final point a whole lot faster within less than a minute, but I still don't actually reach it. In fact, you can show from this formula you can increase Kc as much as you like. You'll never, in fact, reach 1, which is what, where we should be. For a good control system, if you ask it to increase by 1 degree, your output should increase by 1 degree, at least eventually. It may not get there right away, but eventually you would like it to get there. The proportional only controller, the major shortcoming is this ratio over here is always less than 1 indicating that we will never reach our goal. It's a pretty bad controller from that perspective. It's very intuitive what this controller is doing, but it's actually not very effective from a long-term perspective. Let's take this game back down to a smaller number, and I'd like to point out an other interesting artifact. So I'm going to go back to one third. And here's another problem with the proportional controller that we have. So let's run that simulation. And in fact, I'm going to add another sink to the system. I'm going to add a new scope. And I'm going to look at what this flow rate of the hot water is doing. So it's FH dash. And I'm going to see what's that, what that's all about. Let's bring my other mouse. to our process. No. It's asking our valve to suddenly open and then slowly come back. This part is okay. This is acceptable. We can do this. But this is not possible. We can't suddenly open our valves like that. Okay. And in fact, the other problem we have is should we increase this gain to, let's go back to three units, say, and we run that. What we're asking to do to our valve now is <coughs> gets worse and worse and worse. So we're asking our valve to open even more in a very sudden, instantaneous manner, which is not practical and it's not good on op the operation of the valve. change the sign of that gain. 
and take a negative value, think what that means in practice. Okay, so we're trying to increase the temperature here. If I flip the sign of Kc, previously we said Kc is doing the following. We said that if my error is positive, I'm going to open the valve. So I get a larger flow. That makes sense because if my error is positive, it means my set point is greater than my temperature. So for example, 25 degrees is my set point, my temperature is 23. I'm going to get a positive error of two units indicating I'm currently below the required temperature. So I open my valve up and I put that into the tank, put in more heat, and this is eventually going to cycle around. But what if by mistake I had used negative case? So now when my error is positive, instead of opening my hot water valve, I close it. And then think of what that's good, what's going to happen if I keep operating. So every time I'm doing, it's kind of like driving a car where instead of accelerating you brake, and instead of braking you accelerate. What kind of driver is that? one that's going to have a short life, right? <laughs> so let's take a look what happens over here. This tank, let's go to a gain of minus two, run that. You dial to 10 to the minus eight, negative, okay? So you're doing the opposite, taking the opposite action of what you need to take. We call this an unstable system. <clears throat> We've made our system unstable because you're taking the opposite action of what you should be taking. Then that feeds back around and you just take an even greater action in the opposite way and a greater action still. So you set up a, a cycle, a feedback cycle that's not in the right direction. So it's an unstable system. So KC has that shortcoming. It's not a very good controller. Let me end by just pointing out one way that points to what we can do to improve the situation. And we'll look at that after we do. So let's go back to our regular game. Let's go run that again. And to understand what's happening, let's take a look at what the error here is doing. So here's my error. So run that, take a look at error. There's error, and let's also just take a look at my output, side by side. <coughs> Can you see how we might, firstly, let's identify what the problem is. Why are we not reaching our intended goal of one unit? We should be seeing change from zero to plus one on the output here of my temperature if this is a good controller. But we're not, we're only getting halfway in fact. Can you see what is going on here in the error and in the output T to tell what the problem is? identify the shortcoming of this controller so that once we've identified the shortcoming we can fix it up and make it better.